Telegrapher's Equations in Frequency Domain, Part 2. In the last step, we found that we can rewrite our telegrapher's equations in terms of frequency domain when we assume that our signal is some version of a sinus wave or some exponential wave function, which is actually a pretty good assumption. If you look back to the work you've already done, the experience that you already have with electrical engineering or physics, you will find that a approximation in terms of a complex wave function is something we can use very often and that will bring us quite far in many many cases. So all we put in is the assumption that we have some wave, exponential wave expression and we will keep using that and what we get out of that is that we can already solve our time derivatives because we know that the whole signal over time is described just by one frequency for each component and now we can just take this frequency explicitly and all we have to solve is now this space derivative and we rewrite the equations by using a propagation constant and the propagation constant gamma had a real and an imaginary part and was bringing in one complex number all the loads that we already discussed before so r prime l prime g prime and c prime they're all in there now Okay, and after that quick recap, let's jump into the equations. First, we wrote, wrote down, write down what we already had. And uh, also, now, gamma, as a reminder, is put into parts. The attenuation, which is our alpha, and the phase information, which is in the second part, the beta. Now, as I said, we already assumed that our voltage is a wave, so we just write that down. We can have two parts. One is a voltage of a wave traveling in z direction, described by minus gamma z in the exponent, so it's traveling forward. And of course, if you remind us, if you remember, we already had that in the lossless transmission line. We always can superpose a second wave going in the opposite direction. So we have, now we have the most general description we can have, and we will continue just using this first term here. Okay, we just plug that in our equations that we had above. So we are interested in the real part and now we plug them in ua and then the exponential function minus gamma z. And of course, i omega t. Okay, and now we rewrite that a bit by using the description which we know for gamma. So we go up here and we put in minus alpha z and then the second part which is the beta again z and of course never forget the I omega t now when we take the real part of that the first thing we can do is just put the amplitude out so ua is just one way to have then e to the power of minus alpha z is real so we can just put that out as well and then the complex part of uh, no the real part of the complex wave equation is just the cosine term and then we have omega t minus beta z and this is pretty neat because this is now a function that you can draw immediately and we're just going to do that um, we have two axes on the x-axis we put z because this is what we're investigating right now in units of lambda so wavelength and then here we have the voltage as a function of z in units of ua. The good thing is if we take that we can put numbers right away because we know we started at the maximum which is then ua so 1 and we know in the opposite direction minus 1 will be our other limit and from there we have exponential function of minus alpha z so it's a decay just an exponential decay. And we're done with that now we have the envelope for our whole function it's that easy. Second thing is we now put marks on our x-axis. Remember it's in units of lambda, so we just go one, two, three. And we have the difference here between two ticks, which is just one wavelength. And that is two pi over beta, just from our definition. Now the good thing is when we now draw our equation, we know 
we start with a maximum up here because in the beginning we chose that you can chose an arbitrary value we put we chose that to be maximum at time zero and we know we have to get one wave in here before one wavelength is over then another one and the third one and so on and now we have drawn our wave function so our voltage over space and we have a result isn't that nice now um I want to remind you of the wave equations that we already had for the telegraphic equations in a more general form, if you remember. So what we had here in the original form in our last video, so it's uh, the telegraphic equations video, we started with the whole derivation and there we had one very neat and brief form where voltage and current was still mixed. And now the things we want to go, now we have described the voltage, now we want to go towards the current. So we need to go back to an equation that's linking the two. And this is why not start with the telegraphic equation, because this is what we're using anyway. Okay, so when we're looking in here, this is actually a very neat description. Well, we just need the space derivative of the voltage and we can get the current information here. And we just plug that in. Remember this in this version is still time domain. So we have to put that into frequency domain next. Okay, let's do that then. Okay, so we are the original equation. I just write that down once more. And as a reminder, I will put it first in time domain, but then what we do is we put that also in frequency domain. That's the important part. Okay, let's write that down. So here we had R prime times the current plus L prime and that the time derivative was still in times uh, the current as well and it was linked to the space derivative of voltage and now we do just what we do best we add our complex phasor form so the the complex way to write it in order to go to frequency domain And then it looks like this. So here we get the frequency in, now I omega L instead of the time derivative, and we're done. So now the next part is that we use the approach that we had in the beginning. So after we have now the frequency in, um, we take the voltage that we defined in the very beginning as a superposition of two waves. And we can just plug that in. And this time we do not only solve for the forward traveling wave, but for both. Above, I made it a bit shorter, but now we would have to put in both parts to be correct. So first we bring this over, so it's one over R prime plus I omega L prime. And now here, the space derivative of u. Okay, here this part comes from here, put that in. And the good thing is actually when we go up there, all we get is a gamma and a sine. So r prime plus i omega l prime here. And then I just put the term down, the bracket term. Um, it's the description of the voltage, I will keep it in and abbreviate that then with BR for bracket term so I can make it a bit, fa a bit faster. Okay, write that down. And the nice part is here now that we can actually put in this term that we had. So here, abbreviation BR. Now what we do is the following. We look at gamma as we had it and we write down the solution for the current, which then looks like that. So R prime plus I omega L prime over 
g prime plus i omega c prime. And times the bracket term. Now the nice part is that if we put that in, we can just name it differently and we find the definition of impedance times bracket term. And this is really, it's the way that we call that now. It's just we identify that as impedance because this is literally what it is. The impedance is the link between voltage and current. So here, what impedance does, it relates the current and the voltage. And the nice thing is that with this now, since we identified what that is, we can go back to our graph here and just um, have the graph for i as well, because we just need to know the impedance. And I will zoom out a bit here and summarize that. Okay, so when we look at that now, um, first what we see, some final remarks, is the following. So we use periodic functions. What does that mean? So we have periodicity in time and space. That means that first the phase delay of our oscillation is always compared to the reference at z equals zero and defined as beta z. So this is the phase information that we get out of that. And then for a given position z, the voltage oscillates in time. But if we look at a specific time, we see how the voltage oscillates along the length of the line. So we have those two oscillations that are uh, combined together. Now finally, since we found the impedance, we will be using this number a lot. Because all the important information, not all the, but most of the important information is within this one term. So you will be calculating impedance a lot. Usually what we do is we design everything in the system to be at the same impedance, because then we reduce, for example, reflections. We'll be talking about that later too. Now, having put all that in, also one remark, remind, Keep in mind, we have two different um, waves. We had a forward traveling wave and a backward traveling wave. And here we have a current that's a positive current that's associated with the forward traveling wave and a negative current that's associated with the um, backward traveling wave. And we have this sign included in the definition. If you look here at the bracket term, there is a minus in there. Because uh, when we do the derivative, we get from one of the waves a minus and not from the other. Okay, so usually the number we put all that to is 50 ohm. That should be a no number. And usually everything is designed to be at 50 ohm. So that actually you always know how a voltage pulse relates to a current locally. It's always a reminder this is a local equation. This does not describe the the total voltage and the total current at an arbitrary position, but uh, gives you an information on how the wave is traveling along the line. And with that, we made a pretty good step. Um, next part will be to discuss reflection coefficients and mismatch issues. But for now, the main part concerning telegraphic equations and wave propagation is done.